Okay, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, thanks very much for your time today and thank you for attending uh, this Kubro webinar. Um, and obviously, as the inv invitation had described, what we wanted to describe to you today is our unique solution that we deployed at a European operator, which helped to uh, reduce their, actually not just 5G standalone, but 4G, 3G and, and 2G uh, monitoring uh, environments, user plane monitoring environments and all the subsequent benefits of that. Uh, my name is Paul Brett. I'm uh, responsible for Kubro's business in the UK, Ireland uh, and the Middle East. And I'm, I'm the host for today's session. And I'm joined by Christian Ferenz, who's Kubro's uh, chief executive. And actually, uh, Kubro, uh, um, uh, Christian will be covering uh, the majority uh, of the agenda today. Uh, in terms of the agenda, I'll just yeah, briefly cover um the the business and operational challenges that the the service provider have been experiencing and the benefits and the value uh that our solution has delivered to them uh the meat of the session will be then passed to christian to to, to describe you know what the solution was our approach the types of technologies um that were deployed there and the outcomes um uh, that uh, we were able to deliver um then finally we'll summarize and we have a q a session um, at the end. Um, before I move into the agenda, just a couple of housekeeping points, actually. If you have any questions, then feel free to, to put those in the chat section um, and we will answer those probably at the, in the Q&A section. But if they're relevant to a particular topic that we're going through, we can, we can answer them um, at the time. We'll also be posting some polls uh, from time to time during the session. We'd really appreciate your feedback uh, uh, on those, uh, and we'll also be posting some handouts and some resources that you'll be able to take away um, from this session. Uh, so um, I think that's everything as far as the housekeeping is concerned. So if I move now on to um, uh, the description of um, you know, what were the challenges that the the, um, the CSP was experiencing, both from a business point of view and from an operational point of view. And of course, those are, are both completely interrelated. Well, you'll see on the left there from a business point of view, if I'm honest, they are mainly you know, the, the challenges that we see in the service provider environment today. Uh, the need to improve the average revenue per user to increase the return on their investments uh, in the business and increase uh, their sales, to reduce their customer churn, to retain more customers and win more customers, uh, to help manage and reduce their costs, um, again, that they have, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, I guess, uh, challenges which are, are fairly normal that we see in uh, service provider environments, a high cost of ownership of an existing monitoring solution, which intends to increase as uh, the amount of traffic increases. Um, and again, with everybody, as with everybody else, increasing power costs, which is becoming a major concern for, for not only service providers, but I think uh, probably all enterprises and, and all of us. Uh, across the globe today, uh, GDPR compliance, and, and also then the move to 5G standalone technology and the ability to monitor that as well. And obviously in conjunction with those business challenges, the operational challenges that they had were the, the ability to be able to deliver excellent customer service and, and proactively resolve customer problems at the same time as there are increasing customer expectations. There's an increasing cost of monitoring user plane traffic not only because of the complex network architectures that are deployed across multiple technologies but obviously because of the massive growth in traffic volume that we see uh, taking place and continuing to forecast into the future um also from a, obviously from a gdpr perspective it's very important to mask personally identifiable information and finally from an operational challenge perspective the ability to be able to migrate to 5g standalone and be able to monitor that environment while also uh, continuing to monitor their 4G environment, their 3G environment, and their 2G environment as well. So those were the challenges that um, the organization was, uh, was working with. And so um, Kubo were able to develop and deploy a solution that met all of their business and operational objectives uh, and included obviously tech, a range of technologies that, uh, that Kubo uh, design, manufacture and supply, but also a unique CDR generation and optimization capability so we're able to generate cdrs from across that range of, of technologies we're then able to optimize that metadata 
which effectively reduces the amount of data that needs to be exported for storage, monitoring and analytics. And in fact, we were able to measure that reduction uh, up to a factor of a thousand times compared to raw packets while still retaining all of the required data. We we're also then therefore able to mitigate uh, the, the continued increasing volume of user plane traffic because of that uh, optimization capability and also provide a smaller footprint, not only for the visibility solution, but also for their data storage uh, 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 technology, for their monitoring technology and probe technology. And obviously the ongoing benefits of that meant that we could significantly reduce their power consumption, their cooling, uh, requirements uh, and, and rack space when compared to alternative solutions such as IP fixed data. And final point there is uh, uh, we managed to achieve all of that, deliver that capability and retain GDPR compliance. So that's really the section I was going to cover to give you a very high level view of the benefits and the value of the of the Kubro solution. So um, Christian, I'll hand over to you now for, for, for your section. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, so, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, th thanks to the to, to all the participants. Thanks for joining us here on, on, on this on this afternoon. Um, I I want to. I mean, we forget about all marketing stuff. So we 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 are jumping really in the in the in the hard technical facts, and I want to share with you. Uh, the situation why why we are going to develop this and why we have in the meantime a, a, a quite a big success. I mean, it's not only for mobile providers; it's also the same story works also for fixed net providers, for cable and and cheap on providers. And we have recently, I, I was last two weeks in the U.S. and and we spoke with several of these of these people, and we have we have a great response to to our message. And I will show you. I will tell you in, in this in this session what what are the what are the, the advantages here. So in in the meantime, we we all know that that uh, this kind of this kind of data, what 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 customers are producing. So in this case, user data uh, has a lot of value uh, to providers. And and first of all. One thing is they they all want to monetize this kind of data, depending depending on the region where they where they are. It's sometimes more legal than than in other regions, but at the end, uh, the data can also help uh, to prevent uh, prevent issues and also lower the cost in in terms of making making customer happy. And we we have a few use cases where it explains in detail what what concrete situation uh, this data will help but the point is what we also see uh, and and you all know because you're in this industry that the time of endless money is over so the point is here uh, we had to we had to be very efficient with the with the cost yeah? and with also with the operation cost so the time where you can say money is not an issue this is definitely over in our industry so that's the important thing so that we we said okay we have to develop a solution which gives on one side all the relevant information and on the other side uh, keeps the 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 capex and the opex cost low so this this was the this was the goal of of this idea i mean they are they are other competitors out in the market, they they offer similar solution, but they are not focusing on on make it efficient in the way of operation cost. So I will uh, I think yeah you can you can have this presentation anyway you can download it. I, I will I will jump a little bit in the in the, in the, in the concrete use cases. So so one 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 use case and actually this has a very close we have this situation that microsoft services were offline over a few days and customer were unhappy so what happens in this case the xbox is not working or the microsoft office is not working so what what happens and and we we spoke to many operators and of course the the, 
the customers, the subscribers are calling the operator and said, look, my Xbox is not working, my, my Microsoft Office is not working, but it's actually not the fault of the service provider. It's it's the, the fault of, of, the, of Microsoft. And so, but but it produces a lot of calls and a lot of trouble in the in the call center of the carrier. So the point is with with our solution, with our data, we can detect immediately which service is offline. And and we explain this and we pitch this to 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 operators and they they like the idea to say, okay, if such a service is offline, we can immediately proactive inform the subscriber. And what does this mean is First of all, it reduces the load in the data in the call center. And the second thing is, and we all know that when when an issue happens and you know you are aware about the issue, then then it's not so annoying. When you when you know okay there's a traffic jam and you know the reason for the traffic jam, then it's easier to deal with. And 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 this is the same here. When they say okay, Xbox is not working, and you get a SMS, you get a mail, you get you get on the website the information the service is down, and we inform you when the service comes back. Then this is this is really helpful, and this is really uh, reducing the cost in the call center, and this is a this is a major point to reduce uh, to reduce cost in the call center and makes customer more happy. This is actually very simple. But but you need the user plane data because with the user plane data we can give you exactly this this information. This is one I would say this is a this is a major a major case. The second thing is of course there's always bad people in in, in the network and and so so we can we can we can identify a lot of fraud capabilities. So this means unwanted traffic uh, traffic which which call which which causes fraud issues what what is a it, what is a very common situation especially especially it's not so common in 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 europe but it's it's very common in middle east and and in in asia that that people are working as a as a sub carrier meaning they they have high powered uh, wi-fi hotspot and they offer local uh, internet service and resell internet traffic now yeah, to especially for, for for voice calls and things like that so we can detect this with with our technology so so we can detect this kind of of hotspots or what is often it's called sim box and we can detect okay there is unusual traffic so this means we can we can help the provider to uh, to find this this kind of of misusage of of traffic, this is another interesting use case. Uh, then then we have of course and this this is this is geolocation. This is something what is what is really a big a big story because we we have the cell information and we have the the, the data of the application. What what we can do in this context is we can provide anonymized geolocation data per per user and this is a multi-billion dollar business and and we provided this to 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 austrian carriers and they use it during corona time to to see the movement of the customers or the subscribers and they can see okay the subscribers stay at home but furthermore uh, it's a very interesting use case they they sell this data to shopping centers and they sell this data to uh, concert companies because they want to know from which region the people are joining the, the, the concert or going to the shopping center. And, and they, they use this data for steering the marketing efforts. So this is something I mean, this depends on the on the on the regulations in countries, but but in Austria or in most parts of Europe, it's legal when the data is anonymized. It means the the guys who are to buy the data, they don't know who is 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 the person who joins the concert or the, the shopping center, but it's they know it's a unique person. So this is one. This is a very very interesting thing, and and I think many service providers like this idea because this makes really positive revenue stream this is not saving cost 
with with this data they can really make money out of the data this is this is i think this is a huge thing depending on the region it's depending but but it's also it's a very interesting thing and and then we we have we have also questions from customers to to block certain application uh, per location and this sounds weird at the moment but it's actually not so weird when you when you have when you have let's say concerts or football games then often the networks are overloaded because everybody uses social media and video streaming and so so the network is overloaded so and and then you cannot make phone calls and things like that so so what what the idea is is to 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 block traffic based on uh, geolocation so this means in a sector in 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 the sector in the few sectors of of let's say a football stadium during during the the, the, the game some some traffic some applications are blocked to offload the network to prevent overloading the network this is i mean i know this is maybe difficult in europe but but we have talked also to providers in europe they say no this is maybe also by the rules this can be done so this is an interesting way depends a little bit on the on the local situation but this can be done with the data yeah so so we can block we can block traffic specific traffic from uh from receiving and and overload overload the network any questions so far does anybody raise the hand okay okay then the, the next one is it's definitely it's it's definitely we we can we can use also our data for cyber cyber crime situation so there there what we can do because we see we see behavior and we see special people using very specific uh, protocols all the time or very specific applications all the time this leads often to to fraud yeah it's not only that what i described first with the sim boxes but it's also when you see massive amount of of tor traffic from specific ip addresses when you see peer-to-peer -peer traffic this leads always to to a kind of fraud and and the point is uh, especially especially when it comes to 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 company networks i mean if you if you know that many large companies they own own private networks and and in this case uh, the service provider can offer a solution to them to say look we prevent you that someone some of your employees are misusing uh, the traffic and and we can and we can give this information so that the subscriber so that the company is protected by misusing tor traffic or peer to peer traffic because when you use peer to peer traffic this could has have a huge impact on 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 the legal situation because you know peer to peer traffic uh, it could happen that 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 in your premises or in devices of of, of a certain company uh, you store illegal content and this could have a huge impact on, on the legal side so even when you don't know it you you can be part of a of a crime yeah so so peer to peer traffic uh, in a in a company environment is is really really problematic yeah so this is what we what we can what we can do so and I think these are these are use cases, and and then this is this is really a funny use case actually the the the, the customer churn rate yeah the the point is this is this is very difficult for for operators actually because customer churning from one operator to another and it costs a lot of money to uh, to to keep the customer in the network but this is also related to the to the local to the local laws but this is this is something what is very efficient yeah because we we know that carriers to going this approach and this is very very efficient when you when you see that that the customer doing constantly speed tests then then you you can consider that this customer is not happy and what what a customer does which we know he he makes call to this unhappy customer and say 
okay, we, we see you make you make speed tests or did you have any issues with us? And and then the customer complains to the, to the service people and, and what happens then, they can figure out what is the issue, give him a, a small benefit and the customer stays. And they could prove they, they reduce the churn rate by 30% doing using this data. This is this is this this pays back such a solution in one year easily. Yeah. So so this data can be used for tons of different applications. And and the, the point is, and this is this is the interesting point. This is we providing the data, and the customer can use the data with with their own analytics tools uh, to add more use cases yeah so, so so these are prominent use cases what we described but there are tons of more use cases what what typically what we typically can do any questions on the use cases so far okay uh Okay, so so our our idea was when you look when you look to the situation of of classical monitoring systems, uh, they produce a lot of a lot of data per per, per subscriber, and this is the reason is because uh, we have so many different applications, so you need a lot of a lot of a, a lot of metadata output, and we we go away which 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 makes it much more efficient. So, so we add a lot of information, but still we have a small amount of, of, of data doing sending this to the, to the, to the data lake. Because when, when, you see, when you see today that the data lake cost is maybe the major cost in the, in the, the major operation cost in, in such a monitoring system. So the monitoring system itself, the, the probe costs are often not that big. The problem is really the, the, the data lake. The data lake and the later on analytics drives often the cost. So so we we think it's 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 very important to make the to make the output uh, very, very small. And this is exactly what what we have done. And we say we give you still all the information. You see here the 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 sample output, which kind of information we we give, and and really the important thing we give you we give you bandwidth in one second resolution. So this means we can we can based on this bandwidth information we can detect a lot of a lot of a lot of things what you cannot do when when the when the bandwidth solution resolution is not that good so if you if you go to 30 seconds bandwidth resolution then then you then you lose a lot of information I, I, we can we can touch this later if there is some special question about about this idea so okay Yeah, I think this is this is more this is more or less more or less the same the same information. I think we, we I mean you see we, we we see the cell ID and all this information. I think this is this is understood by you. So we do we do we do MS MC and MS ESDN correlation to, to the CDR. So I think this is this is nothing nothing special. Yeah, this is this is now this is now the reason why we why we want to do this one second resolution and maybe uh, maybe you don't see it clearly but this is funny this is this is a what's this is what's up traffic from one from one specific customer and because we have this high resolution so we see you see this on, on this upper side this is kilobit and this is only bit and then you see exactly because of this situation you see who who is the receiver and who is the sender yeah you see exactly uh, who is sending a WhatsApp message and who is receiving a WhatsApp message? I mean, this is maybe not so not so specific for for a carrier, but you can use this data also for troubleshooting. And what you also can use uh, this data because of this resolution is you can detect um, fulfilled peers. Uh, if a peer is running full, then you see this because we have this amount of resolution. I mean, this is a complicated discussion maybe if you need more information then you can you can touch me and I can explain this in detail what what we can do but you see 
and 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 still we can provide this resolution even when we have millions of subscribers and a terabit of traffic yeah so this is this is the challenge the challenge is really giving so precise information with this volume i mean this is not difficult when you have only 100 subscribers but when you have 2 million subscribers and and close to 2 terabit of data constantly then this is a different story okay yeah and this is this is i would say this is one of the major things what what we are doing here the, the point is i mean this is this is typically the big differentiator what what we do then to 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 any flow based approach you know in in the let's say everybody knows netflow and ipfix and 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 what they do is they pro they provide a, a cdr for any flow the problem is only when you when you have this modern application like this web.0 application like amazon like netflix and name it and even a local newspaper you have even in a local newspaper you have three four five eight flows and and the problem is if you if you do a cdr per flow then this kills your data lake and the point is you don't know what these different flows mean in fact so so i give you an example and i can share this later on in a, in a separate session if you want uh, netflix provides 50 60 flows per per video the problem is only and and this these flows are going across the world this is going to the local cache going to us going to uk going to island data centers so so it it does you you you, you have no real information what these flows are carrying so it makes no sense at all uh, to separate these flows and so that's the reason why we why we do why we do this time based window correlation so we give you one cdr for the full application and this is exactly this is not simple to do because this needs a lot of technical effort to 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 do this but but we could manage this and we we have developed this 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 kind of software and and so we we provide a, a fraction of the of the data compared to a flow based system and this this is we think this is a very important thing especially in growing systems especially in in systems with fixed net provider because in in fixed net or in, in cable providers the the, the, the pressure on the cost is even higher than in mobile networks so yeah, and this is this is how we do it. Yeah, actually, so so we we go with our we go with our smartnik approach. This means uh, we have we have on top our load balancers, and then and then we have these four U boxes, and then you see uh, the smartniks. We have eight smartniks, but there are also boxes with ten smartniks, and there are boxes with twenty smartniks, depend on the box. But we do all the DPI we do on the smartnik, and the smartnik is not. A smartnik like an FPGA, this is a CPU. So actually, we have a CPU-based smartnik, and depending on the application, depending on the data, we can we can do up to up to 85 gigabit metadata extraction per smartnik. Okay, so this this makes this makes our system so efficient. So we can scale this endless. So we have the load balancer, then we have the smartniks, and out of the smartniks, um, we 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 then do the correlation on the cpu so the the server itself does not match it does only correlation only but it, it's still a lot of data but but we, we the dpi is done in the smartnik and the smartnik run fully independent from the server so 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 it's it's very it's very efficient and this also makes makes the system small and small not in in terms of footprint alone it makes also the small the system small in terms of cost and in small of operation cost power consumption yeah and this is now such a system live this this is live running here i mean this was during the installation phase and and you see this this is for for one terabit and you see this is only lucas how much how much rec space is this it's 30 you guys right Oh, no, no, it's half 30U, right? What, how much rack space is this? Uh, Lucas, I cannot hear you, but 
but doesn't matter. So, so you see here the packet broker, then you have the signaling broker. This, this switch is not, is, is not relevant in this case. This is a, a special feature. And, and then you have two boxes with, with the NIC cards. And then we have the we have the Kafka server to to feed the data lake. Yeah, what what you what you have to understand, our approach is not selling any kind of analytics. So we don't give you the analytics. So we give you the metadata. We help you to store the metadata in your data lake, and then we are stopping. So so we are not like our competitors or, or friends. They are doing analytics. We don't do any analytics. We we can only help the customer to understand the data. We help the customer to 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 store the data in the data lake, and then our business is over. So we are really providing metadata. So we are not competing against classical monitoring providers. Yeah. So we we are only focusing on the user plane. We use signaling data as well to enrich our user plane, but we are not really a classical signaling monitoring solution for for troubleshooting. This is not what we are doing. So we provide massive metadata for a very efficient way of of producing this data. So this this is this is the approach here. Okay. Yeah, this is this is then then schematic how 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 this how this works in schematic. So we have the tabs. We're getting this from 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 tabs and then we feed it to the load balancer. In this case, it's a, it's a smaller unit. In Normally we would 64 ports and then we have a bunch of, of these servers and they can, they, they do then, they hold the NIC cards, the NIC cards hold, does the DPI and, and then, and then we have a, a signaling probe. This signaling probe could be also a NIC card, so it depends on the situation. But but in this case, we, we use a we use a box, and then we enrich, we send the metadata to the to the boxes, and on the server CPUs we do the correlation. So we enrich uh, we enrich the user plane information with cell ID, radios information, whatever information we we can have, we can also enrich this with with uh, extended DNS records, depends what the customer wants. And then we get this, this metadata in a very efficient form. Typically we use, we use Protobuf, Google Protobuf and send this to our Kafka infrastructure. And then from the Kafka, we send it to the data lake cluster of the customer. And exactly at this point we are stopping. So sometimes we are dealing, we, we are providing the Kafka infrastructure. Sometimes the customer has his own infrastructure. This depends, but typically at this point we are stopping. Yeah, so we don't go far further. We help the customer in the integration of the data lake, and then our 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 job is done. Any questions to this picture? Yeah, there are some questions that we had before. Okay, so but yeah, go. Um, let Please. me read it out. Um, one was how does Kubo help in tapping 5G standalone? Um, as it is HTTPS encrypted. No, look. I mean, this is a this this is this is a this is a common problem. I mean, we we have the same solution as everybody else. I mean, we rely on the on the vendor. Yeah, we we rely on the vendor. And but but for the for the user plane. It's currently not a problem because most of the interfaces what we need are anyway externally. Uh, but but when 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 we have SPI pass, then we rely on the vendors and everybody else. I mean, there is no solution so far. I mean, uh, I'm I'm not sure who who asked this question, but actually uh, to get to get ciphered information out of the SPI pass is really really a difficult challenge. And currently. For what what we see, I mean, we have customers. They they are they are not facing this issue because they are not running this in cloud native. This customer where you see the picture, they running a, a 5G standalone core, but this core is not cloud native. This is a virtual core, and in this case, we can access the data, so no problem. But when it's a when it's a cloud native core, uh, then we rely on the on the network vendor. We don't have any chance. Yeah, so, 
So this is this is this is for sure a big problem, but could not be solved. I mean, if the if the vendor could not give us data, yeah, then we are blind. I mean, we can we can use we can use what what we have externally. Typically for user plane, this is working, but in 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 rare cases, yeah, then we there cannot was a provide the data because we don't uh, the have application the data. detection. Which which methods uh, we are using for that? Yes. No, this 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 is not one method. This is this is a general DPI. This this works on on on, on packet behavior. We are looking in the in the packet itself. Uh, these are by fingerprinting. This is also combined with DNS. So there are there are few methods. That, that this is not one method. These are a few methods depending on the traffic. But it's a classical DPI approach. So we can detect really the application. And when we when we say, for instance, Amazon or let's say Viber, then we can really differentiate: is this a Viber voice or Viber data? Or if it's Amazon, we know exactly. We, I think we can differentiate 35 Amazon services, so we know exactly this is S3 bucket. This is this kind of traffic. So this is very very deep. We we support currently roughly 2,000. 500 applications and and this is i would say 99.9.5 percent of the internet traffic so yes thank you i think so i hope this answers the um question. yeah and this goes hand in hand with the next question yeah how we deal with significant changes in the application signatures yeah we provide constant updates yeah this is there's a constant updates yeah this this is done on, on a two weekly base, three weekly you, base. Yeah. This is for you, now all you the have questions updates, that I see, yeah. so you can carry on. So I think we we are more or less at the end. Yeah, I give you I give you this this example because this this ex, this explains in, in detail what we are talking about in reduction of, of flow data yeah? to give you an idea i mean this is a graph and this is based really on measurements this is on, on real measurements so so consider you have you have a one terabit traffic and you want to have one day only metadata we are not talking here about raw data we are talking only metadata so we need for this metadata roughly uh, 28 for one terabit input per second we need to store the data the metadata is roughly 28 to 30 terabyte per day. And when you when you go this approach with IPFIX, so flow based, then we talk about 300 terabyte a day. Also this is a factor, this is more than a factor 10. And and when you see it, when you want to, and we have customers, they want to store the data for 90 days, then you see this kills any data lake. Yeah, I mean, the cost of the data lake would be enormous yeah, to store only the metadata. And it's not only that you store this, this amount of metadata, then the point is also the, the, the database retrievement time is also crazy. Yeah, so if you, if you want to, to, to search in, in this kind of traffic, then even with the smartest databases, this is, this is really challenging. So, so the point is, so we go the approach not making only the, the hardware efficient. It, we are going also this the way to make the operation cost very efficient. And we think this is the way how it goes. And 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 still we have enough information to to cover all the all the requests. I think the major the major message here is really is is lowering the opex cost. And 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 we receive a lot of attention from large providers even from especially from large providers they say this is the way to go yeah any any other solution to 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 drop i mean there is no other solution because you can you can do it or you can lose it and then you don't have the data so so this is the approach where we think this 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 is the future for us yeah i think yeah yeah i think that was my presentation. So I hope I hope it was. I think we are on time, right? 
Uh, so, yeah, thanks for yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for th thanks, Christian. Um, so just I guess just yeah. to uh, to summarise uh, then, and then I think there was a final question or two as well. Um, so just to summarise, yeah. So hopefully what you've seen is very interesting technology, very interesting use cases. Um, and and what we've been able to do is provide a solution that takes data feeds from multiple environments for both monitoring and, and, and analytics, uh, obviously for security as well. But 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 the, the, the point is that we could reduce customer churn through improved network performance and increase customer satisfaction, as I mentioned earlier, in light of increasing expectations from customers. Um, we're able to, put, to reduce the monitoring, the, the cost of ownership of monitoring and analytics by mitigating the problem of increasing data volumes and the cost thereof uh, of the, the, the storage and, uh, and the probing. And also, of course, helping, helping to reduce CapEx and OpEx costs because of the reduced footprints for both your power as well as power cooling and space requirements. And as, as Christine had mentioned, I mean, in terms of order of magnitude, we're seeing cost reductions, for example, around energy of, you know, uh, uh, two to three times reduction. In the amount of power required, uh, in terms of rack space, you know, so, uh, in excess of sixty percent decrease, and then around the sort of data lake and storage costs, uh, reductions uh, in excess of 70 80 percent. So very significant reductions, and of course they feed into the increases where we can help to increase the the, the average return per user. Um, so the sales um, uh, increase customer retention and the ability to win new customers and increase sustainability uh, as well. So that's really the summary and the content of what we were going to provide today. I guess if we move now on to just those final questions, and thanks for all the questions that have been asked, they've been very interesting actually. We have one, one other question here, uh, Christian, which is also from Shankar, which is to, to say that um, today's operators are looking at capturing and detecting uh, anomalies due to large data to have reduced capacity for a data lake. Do you provide such filtering capa uh, capability to capture anomaly only. Does that does that question make sense? Yeah. Look, I understand the question, the, the, but the problem is, uh, an anomaly you can detect an anomaly only after you have analyzed it. So, so I cannot I cannot detect anomalies upfront. I mean, we we provide definitely different options of of filtering of traffic. We can. We can do IMSI filtering, but at, at, at the end, we had to detect everything. Then we do analysis and then and then we can detect anomalies. So detecting anomalies up front is, is very difficult. Anomaly is is not based on, on one single session, on one single protocol. Yeah. So so of course, of course, what we can do, we can we can say we are not monitoring Netflix or we are not storing Netflix data. That, that, that's definitely possible. But this is done after when, when I go back yeah, to, to, the, to this. Uh, OK, let me let me bring up this screenshot. So when you when you when you go here, I, I cannot the anomaly detection happens after the after the correlation. So what we can definitely do, we had to analyze the traffic and then we can say, look, we are not looking at NetScout, uh, sorry, Netflix, and we are not looking at, at YouTube traffic because we think this is not an anomaly. Yeah? And, and we store only more or less the unknown for us. And then this would, this would reduce the, the, the storage cost dramatically. That's possible. But, but on this level, we cannot detect anomalies on the DPI level. Yeah, this is, this is difficult to do because anomaly is something based on the behavior and based on, on the usage of traffic. This cannot be done on the, on the DPI level. This can be done on the database level or on the correlation level later on. So for, for doing this, we can reduce the cost in the data lake Yes, this is possible, but not on the DPI itself. Okay, any other? Yeah, uh, I think there have been some before. Maybe let us quickly go through everything again. Um, yeah, there was a question about the CPU architecture we are using. Um, Christian mentioned that uh, SmartNIC is using ARM CPUs. 
but um, the servers the we are using they are not ARM CPU based. So is there a reason yes. for that? I mean, I guess a simple question. No, the no the server the servers are not ARM CPU based because because they it's Intel based because of the cost. Yeah, I mean we are using standard servers and and they are mainly on Intel. I mean. Theoretically, we can use ARM-based servers, but there are not much ARM-based servers which which has this form factor to handle um, a lot of a lot of NIC cards. The ARM the ARM solution is only because because the the power consumption on ARM compared to Intel is much lower, and to, to it's it's very difficult to to put a a, a I, I7 core or a Xenon core on a NIC card because of the power consumption. So we use ARM because cost power consumption is a best better ratio than, than on Intel CPUs. And, and the other thing is we have more cores on a on an ARM CPU than on Intel CPU and, and, and DPI is a perfect solution uh, to to do to load balance diff, uh, traffic to different cores. And that's the reason why we are using ARM. So it's a it's a cost and and it's a cost performance power relation factor. So so ARM is more efficient than Intel. There are some applications where Intel CPUs are definitely better than ARM CPUs, but for our use case, ARM CPUs are better. Okay. Any final questions before we we close? I think we're out of time now pretty much um, so i think that's probably everything isn't it so i guess it just remains for me to say thank you once again to everybody thanks for your time and attendance really appreciate your time hopefully you found it interesting and informative um and i think again we'll be posting uh this webinar online so you'll be able to access it uh following on from today and obviously get access to the handouts if you'd like any other information then obviously please get in touch and uh, we'll do our best to help you so thanks very much everybody yes. Have a good day. Okay. Thank you, guys. See you. Cheers. Bye-bye.